Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to speak with Anya Schifrin, someone who has written so much and hopefully will help us find a solution to the problems that we're dealing with today. She is the director of the Institute of Technology, Media, and Communications at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University. Anya, it is so good to see you. Marissa, I'm so honored to be with you. Thank you very much for contacting me and for caring about this incredibly important problem. I think it's like our, it's the biggest thing we're going to have to solve in the next, to, to make sure the next decade moves, moves well, right? So, so Facebook today came out with an announcement, uh, its, its effort to try to deal with the elections. What did you think of it? Well, Facebook, of course, is a major danger to democracy all over the world at this point. And I think many of us have been asking them to do something about election messaging and political advertising for years. Sadly, in the United States, we have a completely paralyzed system at the moment. We have a lot of dark money and campaign finance abuses. We have a federal election commission that is totally paralyzed. And we don't have basic laws that everybody else has. We don't have, you know, mail-in voting or voting on weekends. In many parts of the country, there's been a systematic attempt to disenfranchise people. So for Facebook to kind of sit back and wait for laws is a totally disingenuous position. Some of us have been saying for a really long time, they should be better than the laws. There are things they should have been doing for years. And there's great examples all over the world that they could copy if they wanted to. Look at European countries that don't allow years and years of paid advertising, that re require disclosure of who paid the ads, that don't allow you know, false or hate speech and have laws and have courts that make these decisions. So Facebook has just taken advantage of this legal vacuum in our country to go ahead and really further poison an already polarized discourse. The weirdest thing is I don't even understand why Facebook takes election advertising because they don't make even that much money off it and everybody hates them so much. So I think what they announced today is a step in the right direction, but there is much more that could be done. It, it feels in, in a way like the, a finger in the dam, right? And it's, coming, it's, gonna, it's coming down. Uh, if they... Is there, what do you think Facebook should be doing walking into the November elections? Absolutely. So I'm really happy to say that in the last few months, there have been so many excellent reports and recommendations that have come out. So uh, Natalie Marichal and Rebecca McKinnon have done a report on why we should ban micro-targeting of political advertising. Rebecca Trombel and a group of colleagues in Europe have put out a report called Virtual Insanity, where they talk about the kinds of disclosure that could be done. Laura Edelson at NYU and many others have been looking closely at the ad libraries and talking about how those could be strengthened. So a huge amount more of disclosure needs to happen and privacy needs to happen. Anne Ravel from the Forum Federal Elections Commission, she was a commissioner before, has just written an op-ed on how we could provide the Honest Ads Act to broaden definitions of what is considered political messaging. We've seen that whole Stop Hate campaign, which NAACP and many others are part of, to pull ads. And my own paper is coming out on this in a couple of weeks with the Roosevelt Institute. I'm actually going even further than all of these excellent ideas and really what I, I call beyond disclosure. So I think that disclosure is great, but then as Joan um, Donovan says, Facebook discloses and then the rest of us clean up their mess. And I find that ridiculous. You know, Facebook barely gives out any information. Then they start something called crowd tangle. Then all the journalists, all the academics start going through the data for Facebook, which Facebook probably has anyway, and saying, well, you should do this or you should do that. So my, what I'd like to see the platforms do is commit to a voluntary fairness doctrine. Well, from the get-go, they say, you know what? We're not going to profit off this stuff, right? 
you have no right to virality, as Jack Dorsey said famously a couple years ago. What we're going to do is to have a new feed of quality information on the topics that matter. And that can be debates, town halls, provided by the campaigns, provided by, you know, fair commentators and respected media, and just do away with all this garbage out there. And, you know, okay, the platforms love to say we're not, you know, our platforms are publishers, but that's just not true. I mean, that went away a long time ago. So why don't we embrace it and actually put out a quality news feed? They've already started doing those election cards, which are actually fantastic. I myself learned from Facebook that my polling place had changed last spring, which I had not realized. So let's just take that a step further and put out some quality news. And of course, the other exciting development has been Australia and France requiring Facebook to start paying for the news that they use and Google. And of course, now they're lobbying and trying to get out of it, but they could do that too. So these companies have, they're so proud of themselves. They think they've done so much for the world. Well then do something for the world. Let's do some more things for the world. There's tons of stuff they could step up and do. You know, and again, why ban political ads a week before the elections? Why not ban them permanently? Right, right. Um, Two months before. And again, it's been four years. I mean, yeah. you, you just look at uh, Black Lives Matter four years ago versus mm -hmm. today, uh, and the and the this Tuesday they talked about Russian uh, networks getting pulled down again. Um, from what from where we sit, I we haven't seen any real significant change, and it certainly seems to have uh, pulled societies further apart, uh, created the us against them, made facts debatable. Um, can you even have, if you don't have the facts, can you actually have integrity of elections? Can you have elections? No, you cannot have, a, not just elections, you cannot have a functioning democracy without baseline agreement on facts. And um, one of the things I've been doing this summer is writing about the 1930s when propaganda was considered to be a huge, huge problem. And it actually was because we saw the rise of the Nazis, we saw Stalin. And it's um, very, very clear that if you don't have Hannah Arendt, many people have written about this and talked about this. If you don't have baseline facts, you don't have baseline understanding, your society will die. And we, know, we haven't talked about COVID, but what could be more clear than the fact that you know, my aunt is getting three or four WhatsApps every single day saying it's a conspiracy, you can't get the vaccine, you'll get a chip. I mean, this stuff is garbage. And if you can't even, you know, if trust is decayed to this point, and the articles about all of this sort of say, oh, isn't it terrible? There's all this polarization, there's all this disinformation. But we also know to a large extent through work like yours, who's actually putting this out there? It's not some co- I mean, I don't, you know, I don't want to sound like conspiracy. We also have to really understand very clearly who are the people who are putting this out there? How are they profiting? And, you know, again, a minimum, I know there's academic argument about I know there's academic arguments about labeling and whether that makes sense, but the very minimum is to put a little border around this garbage on WhatsApp that says, hey, this started from whoever it started from, so that at least people know where it came from. Because once it's been repurposed and recycled and passed along, nobody has a clue. Um, in terms of how the content and the technology work together, right? Uh, Shoshana Zubov. I didn't hear that. The content and the content and technology and the mm. targeting. The, so the way all of it, a uh, behavior modification system, which we don't really label it that way. Uh, that book by Shoshana Zuboff last year was uh, surveillance yeah. capitalism. Capitalism. Yeah. Uh, this is designed this way, and yeah. Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, they know this that it is breaking the news. What is preventing them from actually acting on it? Because I, I was much more optimistic two years or, or four years ago. I was optimistic because these platforms moved so quickly to pivot to mobile. It took them only two years. And it's four years later. So obviously, is it just money? Is it a lack of understanding of the impact on, on democracies? Yeah. 
So while I was writing my PhD dissertation on how to fix the problem of online mis and disinformation, nobody from Facebook gave me one interview. It was remarkable. I have spent hours and hours and hours with regulators in Brussels and France. I've gone back to them over a period of years. Nobody at Facebook would ever speak to me. And I tried everything, including, by the way, friends of friends who said, oh, they're so nice. So-and-so will talk to you. They just never would. So I don't have any insight. But I think that what's happened at Facebook is a combination of a whole bunch of toxic things. Um, and I, you know, I speculate as to their motivations in my dissertation. You know, I think it's partly, above all, they wanted to avoid regulation. So they started putting forward this idea that the solutions were things like funding fact checking, right? You know, funding media literacy training. That was like easy for them. You pay for that and then hopefully nobody will regulate you. So I think it's partly, I think it's greed and I think that it's ideology and I think that they conveniently, everybody does this. It's like the old, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. They were so committed to the idea that Facebook was great and Facebook would solve problems and social media would connect everybody that they simply couldn't see that they were actually spreading hatred and killing around the world. And then once they saw that, they couldn't really handle it. And they sort of, a lot of them, like Zuckerberg, seemed to have just doubled down, right? So the more you try to talk to them and the more you tell them, the more they don't seem able to absorb new information. And that's obviously a sign of something wrong because smart people learn the facts and they adapt their ideas. But they keep bringing out these cliches about the marketplace of ideas when, you know, my husband Joseph Stiglitz has written very clearly about how it's not a real marketplace. So has Zainab Tufekshi, so has Tim Wu, but explains them for a long time why this isn't a real marketplace of ideas. And they just persist. So I think they've just become entrenched. And you know, I'm not their psychologist, so I don't actually know. But I will say there's clearly internal dissent, obviously. Um, it's just a shame it doesn't seem to have reached the top. I think it's convenient for them to stick to their guns because they're making a lot of money. Right. And they keep making money and the market, uh, the market incentives actually don't discourage them. In fact, encourage them to, to follow this path. So uh, in, your, in the writing, in your dissertation, in the studies yeah. that you've done, how do we solve this? So I think it's going to be like, by the time I finished my three years of research and writing, I came to the view that all of the things people are trying are going to have to be tried. So yes, there's a role for the fact checking and the media literacy and the community engagement, but there's really a big role for, for regulation. And that will have to be on so many levels, you know, things like banning micro-targeting, things like forcing disclosure of, algor you know, their algorithms, as in, you know, as in France, things like privacy protections. Um, I think that countries like German Germany that have laws about um, making the platforms liable or even some of the hate speech laws, I think those countries should be allowed to have them. I mean, I know we're in a tricky position, which is if Brussels passes regulations, then, oh God, everybody worries that China, Vietnam, Singapore is going to copy them. But I think those are countries that were anyway censoring media and controlling media. And so if democracies want to pass regulations, they're going to have to do it. Ditto all the copyright, which is on the other side of the equation, right? That's provisioning news and providing for a supply of quality news. All those tech companies have to pony up money and they should obviously be taxed. So I have a lot of ideas. I wish I could say there was one big grand idea. I don't, but there's millions, dozens of things that need to be done straight away. And also as people like David Kay keep reminding us in line with UN and international principles on freedom of expression. So yeah, that's that. Let's not even go to the Facebook oversight board. So let me- right. let's not. <laughs> there, were, there were several books that I thought were fascinating, like Yohai Benkler, the MIT, uh, looking at um, the role of of not just social media, but really how media took the lies and amplified the lies. And then mm -hmm. Quake, Jameson's book, Kathleen Hall Jameson, Cyber War, actually said very similar things, but looking at the narratives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, media, 
its role. You have talked a lot about social media, but it has definitely impacted journalists and news organizations. How did you see our roles evolve and where does it need to go? Gotcha. Well, I think that journalists have done, it obviously it depends. I think that journalists have done a really good job of calling out the lies, of being skeptical, and of providing quality information. So I wake up every day in admiration of people like you, your colleagues at this TV station that was forced to close in Philippines, our colleagues in India who are struggling so much right now in the US with threats against journalists. So I think that journalists have done a fantastic job of reporting what's going on and uh, really staying with it. So I am not in that camp of bashing journalists. I also think that in the US, they've done a really good job of calling out the lies and now saying, actually, that's not true. Trump said X, but that's not true. So I think that's really important. Um, for the future, as you know, all of this is being done while journalists are facing financial ruin as well as physical threat. So I think the main thing we have to do straight away is get more funding to local and quality journalism around the world. I think that where countries that have an Australian Broadcasting Corporation or a BBC should thank their lucky stars and, you know, sure, criticism is great, but you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Um, I think that we need to see a lot of things like some of the stuff Canada's doing and, you know, what Victor Picard talks about, vouchers and tax credits for media outlets. So I think we need to see a massive influx of funding. And um, I think that journalists will, you know, keep, keep doing what they're doing. Now, I have edited three volumes on the problem of media capture. And that's, of course, extremely, uh, you know, a serious problem in many, in many places in this world and a growing problem where what you have are oligarchs or autocrats combining forces. So Turkey, Poland, Hungary are all examples where the media has been put in the service of the state and the rich person that has interest. Dare I say this is probably a terrible problem in the Philippines. So I do think media capture is a terrible problem. And it hurts me when my students say to me, you know, they're from Brazil, like, oh, the media is terrible. They're doing such a horrible job. They're so corrupt. They're just working for the rich. You know, that is a problem. And we have to do something about it. And again, there's lots of regulations and work that's been done on this, but I don't think we can let that distract from the real problem, which is we need far more funding for quality information. And a lot of that is going to have to come from the tech companies. So agree with everything. And so we talked about me, let's talk about the people people who consume the news, the people who are manipulated on the platforms, the people who are micro-targeted. I mean, the goal of influence operations is to change the way people think and ultimately the way they act, right? And that's happened in the last four years. So how, does, how do we in a democracy, how do people in a democracy, people who have, uh, you have Portland, you have the things that have happened in the United States, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's shocking to the rest of the world as well, right? So how, how do you see this? How will people change what they've been, I'm going to say Pavlov's dogs, what they've been conditioned or, or led to believe? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of a three-part problem, right? So clearly one thing that we need, you know, and I always look at the supply and the demand, right? So the demand is the audiences and the supply is the garbage that Fox is putting out or the tech companies are putting out. And we have to address both sides of this problem, right? So we know perfectly well that in India, you know, Facebook executives who are aligned with Modi refuse to stop putting out incitement, right? We know, we, and we've seen examples of this over and over again. The Wall Street Journal had that article about how within Facebook, they had a whole unit that was looking at not recommending all this polarizing material and it got shut down. So a huge problem we know is that the recommendations and the algorithms, you know, on YouTube and all these places are sending people down the rabbit hole. So that's, that's something that has to stop straight away. Then the other part is, of course, loads of funding for media literacy training, 
people need to understand, you know, in the schools, they have to be taught what's true, what's not true. And again, so often it comes back to the journalists around the world. There are all these journalists who are volunteering to go into classrooms and teach people, teach kids, like how to understand the news. But that should be more systematized, right, obviously. Um, and I've actually got a paper coming out. Peter Cunliffe Jones wrote most of it, but I've got I've got a bit of a contribution in his paper on media literacy that will come out this fall, especially looking at the global south. And then the third point, you know, I'm married to an economist, so obviously there are economic and societal roots to all of this. And one key point is the fact that when you have young men with no jobs, they're and weapons, they're going to get up to trouble. And I don't care what country you're looking at, but these guys, these terrifying militia that are showing up right now and beating up, you know, I've got one of my college buddies who's out with the wall of moms every night in Portland. You know, these militia are showing up with weapons and the police in some places are just giving the bottles of water and thanking them. So that core army of young men with weapons, well, A, we shouldn't have guns like that in the hands of people to begin with, but that's a whole other story in our country. But B, those people, they should all be given jobs straight away. I was so touched by the Prime Minister of New Zealand who says that every you know kid under 30 should be volunteering, volunteering, taking care of somebody, you know, in school, right, or working. And we need like massive jobs core to reach these kids, you know, whether it's in the inner cities of New York, where I live, or out in the red states where a lot of the manufacturing and mining jobs have dried up and folks are taking drugs, like they need jobs and they need to spend less time getting riled up on social media and looking at YouTube and more time out doing something to help society. Absolutely. You sound like a voice of reason. And <laughs> the voice of reason is yeah. winning right now. I guess the last question is, you know, what, uh, what makes you optimistic that this is all going to happen in time fully have free and fair elections in the United States? Uh, mm -hmm. I have vested interest for this to happen quickly. I see a runway of maybe a year or so, right? So yeah. um, what makes you optimistic? Okay. Well, I'm not sure I am, but all right. I mean, I just want, want to explain that in my family, I came from two generations of refugees on both sides. So my family left, on my dad's side, they left Russia in 1917, and they left France in 1941 after the Nazis arrived. And my family in Spain were military family, and my grandfather fought for the Republic against the fascists and couldn't leave, and they left in 1939. So both sets of my parents and both sets of my grandparents were refugees. And in fact, on my grandfather's side, twice, two times. And the second time was a lot, it was not fun, I can tell you, because he was older. So I think I'm probably hyper aware of the dangers of what used to be called propaganda, what we call now disinformation, misinformation, and the dangers that it poses to society and to democracies. I'm completely aware and have been really since 2016. This is a key personal thing I worry about. So I'm worried extremely worried. The one thing that gives me optimism, well, there's two things. One is that in the time that I've been studying this problem, I have seen so many good solutions and good recommendations coming out from academia, from think tanks, from civil society. But like four years ago, everybody threw up their hands and said, well, we don't want state censorship. We don't want corporate censorship. Oh, gee, what are we going to do? And you know, they played into this, right? They would show up at the hearings and say, well, Congress doesn't know what they're doing. There's a bunch of old people. They don't get it, which is, by the way, what everybody always says, right? Like, that's what, you know, IMF used to say, oh, this is complicated. Like, you hide behind the technical stuff so that you, you diminish and cut out everybody else. So, so that's, um, there's plenty of know-how, there's plenty of knowledge, there's plenty of solutions now, and we need to implement them. So it's the political will. And then the second cause for optimism is obviously our young people. I mean, living in New York City at the heart of the COVID pandemic and watching my students every single day take care of each other, take care of the sick, 
you know, send in masks, go out and do volunteer work, you know, march, speak up and criticize all of us about Black Lives Matter. So I just think the next generation are incredible people. And I apologize all the time that we didn't fix all those problems, but absolutely, I think they are capable and I hope that they will. And I hope you're right. And I mean, thank you. Thank you so much, Anya Schifrin. Columbia University, thank you for joining us.